Father, we thank you so much for this time. This is a precious, precious moment. Uh, every Sunday where us brothers and sisters can come together and worship and honor and love you and grow closer and closer to you. I just pray that this time would be used by your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and encourage us in your word and also in who you are and what happens in our lives when we rely solely and completely on you. And we ask for these things in the name of that precious, precious son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's start out here in verses one through six. The word of God says this. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, I think as we go through these first six verses, there are usually two questions that pop up. And the first question we see in the first two verses here, it says that Jesus, when he found out the Pharisees knew that many people were being baptized by him, and even more so than John, the apostle John here takes a, a step out of the narrative for a moment and says, Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. Why would he do that? Well, why would Jesus not baptize? Why is that important to know? Well, if we go earlier in the Gospel of John, we find that Jesus' baptism is that of the Holy Spirit. It's a very clear and strong emphasis. So I think all that John is doing here is making sure there's no confusion as to what the baptism of Jesus Christ is. There's no confusion that he has not come to baptize with water, but he has, in fact, come to baptize with the Holy Spirit, which is our seal and our sign of salvation. So there's no, there's no room here to say that, well, Jesus baptized with water, so therefore maybe you can be saved by baptismal water. No, the baptism of Christ is clear in the Gospel of John is that of the Holy Spirit. And the second question that comes up, and this is, uh, we're going to spend some time, a few moments here, kind of talking about this. The second question, if you look in verse 4, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Why did Jesus have to, have to pass through Samaria? There are a few reasons why. Um, the text makes it very clear. It's not Jesus needed to, could pass through Samaria. Jesus chose to pass through Samaria. It is very imperative that it says Jesus had to pass through Samaria. So there are three reasons. I think all play together. It's not one or the other or either or or a combination of the three. I think it's all of them. The first is the most direct and logical. Jerusalem to Galilee, the easiest route is through Samaria. Just makes sense. If you look at a map, all of your Bibles, you have a study Bible of some sort, you should hopefully somewhere have a map of the ancient Near East and ancient Israel. It's a straight line through Samaria from Jerusalem to Galilee. Now, this is important, though, because the second reason Jesus has to pass through has to do with why other people wouldn't pass through Samaria. So, he passes through Samaria and says he has to do this after he realizes that the Pharisees are hearing these great things about him. Now, at this point in the story, Jesus' relationship with the Pharisees is already very rocky. If you go back to John chapter 2, what you find is the great scene of Jesus cleansing the temple, and you have Jesus overturning tables, chasing out people with whip. He, he is very righteously angry over the, the commercial use of the temple. And the Pharisees and the religious rulers of the day obviously would have been very, very upset by this. Even in that same passage, we find him say that he's going to destroy the temple and then raise it back up. Now, in the text, it tells us that he's referring to his body. He's referring to his crucifixion. But the Pharisees don't know this. So they hear of this guy who's chasing people out with whips from the temple, and he's saying he's going to destroy the temple and raise it back up. They are most likely very concerned by this. So why does he pass through Samaria? I think part of it is the Pharisees would never touch foot in Samaria. And in a moment here, I'll explain why they would never touch foot in Samaria. But they just wouldn't do it. They had a whole route. Even though going through Samaria was the easiest way to travel out of Jerusalem, to travel north, the fact is they would never, ever, ever want to pass through this land because they thought it was unholy. They had a whole route to go around it. Now, why uh, 
this is important. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment. But as Jesus is realizing, I need to get out of here. Well, not realizing. He knows. But it's not his time yet to face the Pharisees. That comes later. This isn't him running away. This isn't him scared. None of that. He simply knows it's not his time yet to face the Pharisees and to be crucified. He's not ready. It's not time. So he leaves and he goes through Samaria, an area where he would not be followed by the Pharisees or any religious elite of the day. The third reason is he has a woman at a well in Samaria that he needs to go talk to. There is absolutely a divine appointment involved in this as well. So again, it's not one or the other. I think all three of these play a big reason as to why he has to pass through Samaria. Now back to a point I just made. Why is it that the Pharisees would not want to pass through Samaria? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If you read your Old Testament, you will find a very long history of conflict between what we'd call the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judea. Under King David, they were united, but the northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes, broke off because of a king named Rehoboam. Rehoboam was going to impose a lot of taxes upon them, and the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes, said, we don't know. We had too many high taxes under Solomon, and now his son is telling us he's going to tax us even more. We don't want that. We have no desire to be taxed and burdened that way anymore, so they break off. And all that's left in the south is the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Now, as red-blooded Americans, I think all of us can maybe sympathize a little bit as to why they'd want to break off. Taxes seem to be a big issue for us. Our country had some founders that had some issues with taxes as well. Um, but the problem here, the main problem that, that's going to pop up is in order to break off, they have to break away from the kingly Davidic line. So they get their own king who has no connection to David. And again, if you know your Old Testament prophecy, the Messiah is to come through the line of David. Jesus himself, as we know, came through the line of David. So when the northern ten tribes split, they reject the Davidic line. They are so focused on their current state and the monetary gains and their, their physical health, wealth and well-being that they neglect the promises of God through the Davidic line and they break away. And so to make a long story short, the next few centuries, both kingdoms get conquered by different invading armies. The northern kingdom has an easier time of it. They, most of them, a lot of them, get assimilated into the society. They kind of adapt to the culture. Uh, they, they intermarry, so some of the Jewish bloodlines a little less and less. They adapt some new customs from these new cultures. Well, the southern kingdom of Judah, when they're conquered, they are exiled. They are completely taken away from the Holy Land, and they're exiled for quite a long time. Now, eventually, another nation comes into the picture, conquers the whole area, and unites the southern kingdom back to the Holy Land. He brings them back. And then when this happens, the northern kingdom, the, what we'll call the Samaritans now at this point, they're excited to see their fellow Jews come back. They are happy. And when this, if you read the book of Ezra, you'll find that when the southern kingdom comes back into the Holy Land, they're actually allowed to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem, which had been destroyed. Now when this happens, the northern ten tribes, the Samaritans who are there, go before the, the southern tribes and say, you're, get, you're getting to rebuild the temple. Well, guess what? We're Jews too. We worship Yahweh too. We want to help you. But the southern kingdom has some pretty hurt feelings because they've been exiled for about two centuries from the Holy Land. And these are the guys that broke from the Davidic line and broke from the mess messianic promises of God. So they refuse it. And for the next four centuries from there until now at the scene we're about to read with Jesus at the woman at the well, there is intense dispute, intense animosity between Samaritans and Jews. They hate each other. Uh, we know from there's an ancient Jewish historian a little bit after the time of Christ named Josephus, who makes it clear that even in that first century AD, they're still fighting. Roman soldiers are still being called in to break up skirmishes between Jews and Samaritans. These people hate each other. They hate each other. It is unclean for the Jews to go there. They, they find it vile and repulsive to be there. Which is why now, as we read verses 7 through 15, this conversation Jesus strikes up with this woman, this Samaritan woman, is so beautiful and powerful and why if we really get what's happening here, I think God will do something to our hearts. Starting in verse 7, it says this. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. 
Now, for us to kind of understand why the Samaritan woman is clearly a little annoyed or agitated or at least confused by what Jesus is doing here, let me, let me give us a modern example. Say we're all good Denverites. We love our Denver Broncos. Let's say that we're at a Denver Broncos versus New England Patriots game. You're there three hours early. You're tailgating. You have a barbecue up. You got your brats and your burgers going. You're ready. You got your cardboard cutout of John Elway doing his helicopter dive in the Super Bowl. You're good to go. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you see this guy in a New England Patriots jersey and a New England Patriots hat. He's shouting to his friends about TB12 is wicked awesome. And he comes up to your barbecue, looks you dead in the eye and says, that looks fantastic. Can I have one of those brats? I can see the red in some of your eyes already. I can see it. Now I'm telling you, if you think this would be frustrating for you as a Denver Bronco fan, add a thousand years of animosity and war to that feeling, and then you might get an idea of how the Samaritan woman is feeling when she sees a Jewish man who's dressed differently than her, who's speech is different than hers, come up to her and ask her for some water. She's not happy about it. So as we go on, her response is, again, a little bit angry, maybe a little bit annoyed. But Jesus' response is very different. In verse 10, he says this, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it And who is it that is saying to you, give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. So Jesus takes this woman's animosity and says, no, no, no. If you knew who I was, you wouldn't be anxious, you wouldn't be annoyed, you wouldn't be frustrated. If you knew who I was, you would be so joyous and happy, and you would want not water from this well of Jacob, but the living water. And Jesus will reveal to her what that living water is going forward. Her response is this. The woman said to him, So you have nothing to draw water with. Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So here we see some of the Samaritan woman's heart. She's, one, annoyed by the question, but now he's, he's telling her that there's this living water that she would rather have, and she's at the well of Jacob. She's at this well that was of who the Samaritans considered their father. He was like their Abraham. The reason for this is, is pretty clear. They were the northern ten tribes of Israel. Well, who is Israel? Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Okay, it's from him that they attach their legacy, it's from him that they attach their connection to Yahweh, to God, that they attach all of their spiritual life. Jacob is their, is their forefather. He is their guy. And they look to him. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of things in life we're going to look to. In all sincerity, if you're going to look to Jacob, that's, there's a lot worse things to look for. There's a lot worse things to look to. And we're going to talk about some of those things in a bit here. But the Samaritan woman is attaching herself to a man who, good, godly man. He's the father of the 12 tribes. He is from the line, he has the line with which the Messiah will be born. He's not a bad option, humanistically thinking or speaking. And now Jesus comes here and says, I have better water than this well has. There's a more bountiful water. And she is hurt by this. She is dismayed by this. She doesn't understand what's going on. She is wondering, what, what on earth are you talking about? This is Jacob's well. This is Jacob's water. You're telling me there's a better water than this? No way. No, how is that possible? There can't be a better water. There just isn't. And yet Jesus says there is. In our lives, we are going to encounter times when Christ is telling us What you want or what you think you need, that's not it. All of us, believers, unbelievers, whomever it may be, you're going to encounter times and probably a lot of times in your life where you want what you want or you want what your heritage has told you you want. You want what the American dream tells you you want. You want what society tells you what you want. And Christ is going to tell you that's not it. 
It's not. And you are either going to respond wanting more or you're going to respond rejecting such a claim. As we go forward, I ask you as we keep reading, let your heart and your response, believer or unbeliever, when Christ comes to you in that way, let your response be, what are you telling me, Jesus? What do you want from me, my Lord? In verse 13, Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. So why is it that Jesus will come to you and tell you and make it clear to you that what you're wanting isn't enough because you're going to want more of it later? There are going to be a million things in this world that you're going to look to, cling to, want, and desire. The problem with all of those things are that they stop. They fade away. And you're going to have to jump to a new thing or jump to a new version of it. I want you to think real hard and deep about the things in your life that you're clinging to right now and have ever clung to in your life and ask yourself, have these things ever, ever fulfilled me all the way through to now? And if you think some of it has, ask yourself again, do I think it will fulfill me till the day I die? And if you think it even will take you to there, I want you to ask yourself, will it continue after I die? I'm going to tell you no matter what it is, even if you think it's going to last you till the day you die, there is nothing of this earth or of you that is going to last after you die. Everything fades. Everything decays. We do. Everything around us does. There is nothing in all of creation that will ever, ever, ever surpass the eternality that is found in our Lord and our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There is nothing. So if you want living water, you can't go to Jacob's well, you can't go to your good grades, you can't go to the stability of your family, you can't go to how much money is in your bank account, you can't go to how good your job is or how secure your job is. There is nothing you can look to. You can't look to your identity. You can't look to how well you perform. You can't look to who you're attracted to. You can't look to who, how many people are attracted to you. You can't look to how well you play sports. All of those things fade and die, just like all of us will. All of it goes away, and you will always live your life wanting something else. Because there is one thing that you're not realizing or you're not remembering that will fulfill it. And it is this living water that Christ is offering. It is this living water that Jesus is bringing about to this woman at the well. There is nothing besides it that matters. And he says that if you take of this living water, the water that I will give, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, if you want eternal life, if you want to be in Christ, drink his water. Come to him for everything you need. Come to him for every last single thing you need. If you are a believer and you're in a dry period right now in your life, I want to tell you something. You may know of the living water and you may have eternal life, but if you feel discontentment, if you feel like God has left you, if you feel dry and weak and weary and you're wondering, where is the fervor, where is the living water and the beautiful, blessed relationship with God that I felt when I first was saved? Where is that love that was there when I first begun? Well, I'm telling you, it's still there. The problem is, is you are focused on all the things I just talked about. You can have the living water and have eternal life, but if you're leaning on yourself, I'm going to tell you the biggest trap you're going to fall into as a believer, at least my biggest trap, is you're going to lean on how well you follow God. You will lean on how well you obey Christ. And you're going to think, I'm doing really well in this season. And when you think you're doing really well, you're going to feel connected to God. But the moment you mess up, and you will mess up, The Lord above knows I mess up on a daily basis. You will mess up in this life. And when that happens, when you mess up, you are going to crumble. Because your life 
The way you're living is not founded upon the living water. It's founded upon how well you drink and live with the living water. You think of yourself in a way that says, I am following God really well right now. That must mean the living water is flowing in me. But the moment you fail, the moment you get angry, the moment you, 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 you come to a place where you're wondering, why am I not providing for my family the way I should? Why am I getting angry at my spouse? Why, why are my kids annoying me and bothering me so much? Aren't I a Christian? Don't I have eternal life? Why are all these things happening to me? How come I'm being tempted like I haven't been tempted in years? Why are all these things so hard? And you're going to think, you're going to question the living water. Not because the living water has failed you, but because what you're trusting in, your ability to follow Christ, your ability to be good in the church, your ability to live in a harmonious way with those around you, when you fail on that, you're going to crumble because you're trusting how well you follow Christ. It's not enough to trust how well you follow Christ. It's not enough to trust anything other than Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. That is all you can rest your hope on. So I ask you, if you are in that dry season or you feel like maybe a dry season's coming, I've been in so many in my life, remember, that dry season is not because of Jesus Christ. That dry season is not because Christ is not with you. It's not because the living water is no longer sufficient in your life. And it's also not because you're irredeemable. It's not because you're so bad that you're going to struggle your whole life. We're all going to struggle. It's not just you. But the difference between a Christian who lives out that reality and the joy of the Lord and a Christian who lives out that reality suffering and struggling, thinking they're never going to do it right, is the Christian who lives out the fact that they're going to make mistakes and not be perfect, that Christian who is joyous in that is looking to Christ for the security. He knows no matter how much he messes up, even though we strive and we should grow closer to God in our life, we should see that. We should see fruit. But if you have those seasons and you know they're going to come, you're going to have joy still because you look at Jesus Christ. You find your hope in Jesus Christ. And if you don't, you're going to struggle for the next how many years God has allotted for you in your life here. You're going to have eternity. You will. You will. If you're in Christ, you will have eternity no matter how much you struggle. But you could do a lot more for the kingdom if you're leaning on Christ and Christ alone. And when you fail, you say, Father, forgive me. Thank you for Jesus. And let me get back on my feet because I know it's the Holy Spirit that's guiding me. That needs to be our response. That has to be our heart. And if it's not, like I said, you are going to struggle your way to eternity. And I, I think God prefers it. I would much prefer I think we prefer it in our lives to not struggle to eternity, but live every day for God on our way to eternity. Now, as we get to verse 15 here, there is some debate on how, if you look at the woman's responses, there's some debate on what she, what's going through her head in the theological community. There's two main views and one other view that I'm going to talk about. The, main, the two main views, the first view is that in her responses, the Samaritan woman is just totally oblivious to what Christ is saying. Has no idea he's talking about anything spiritual at all. Um, in John 7, we see a connection between the living water and the Holy Spirit. And obviously, uh, he's already talked about the living water blowing up into eternal life. So we as believers clearly know what he's talking about. But there's a lot of people who argue that this woman at the well has no clue. She's just thinking he's talking about living water, and that's it. The other view is that maybe she has some insight. Obviously, she doesn't know exactly what Jesus is talking about. But she has some insight. There is some idea or thought. He's not just talking about water here. Now, both of these work. Personally, if you go further in the text, I, I see some insight in the woman. She identifies Jesus as a prophet. She recognizes messianic prophecy. So I, I think if I were pushed, I would probably lean more towards she might have some insight here. She doesn't seem totally aloof to spiritual things. But I, either way, uh, I, I think that her responses can still reveal a lot to us. Now, the other side one that I wanted to talk about is actually, if you read John Calvin's commentary on John 4, it's, it's kind of funny. He thinks she's, she knows exactly what he's talking about, or at least has a good idea, but she is just being very sarcastic to him. 
He thinks that she is just full of sass in all of her responses. And I don't think this is true, but I do recommend that as you read it, at least once, read it in that light. And if you like the show Parks and Rec, you might get a kick out of it. <laughs> so I, I talk about this and I bring this up because of, of verse 15 here. And her response is this to Christ talking about this living water that leads to eternal life. She says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Now, she could be talking about actual water. She could be. Or she could have some spiritual insight. Either way, what John wants us as a reader to get from this, I think, is clear. What John wants us as the audience, we know what's going on. We know who Jesus is. If you've read the gospel up to this point, if you continue reading, you know what is being talked about. And this response is profound. I want to step back again and remember who she's talking to. Remember who Jesus is talking to. Remember that there is animosity out their ears between Jews and Samaritans. There is no room for discourse or dialogue. There's records that say the Jews wouldn't even touch anything touched by a Samaritan. If there's a possibility that a Samaritan touched something, the Jews would want nothing to do with it. It was defiled and unholy. We don't know much about Samaritan beliefs. I'm fairly certain they probably had some similar views about the Jews. I think that's a good assumption. Jesus is bringing this to a woman who has every cultural imperative to hate him and to not listen to him, to want nothing to do with him. And yet, even, even if she doesn't realize what he's talking about or have any idea what he's talking about, she still pays him mind. She still listens to him. She still recognizes this man has something to say. She still sees something in Christ. I mean, her first reaction to him is, why are you talking to me? And now all of a sudden, just a few verses, just a few moments of dialogue later, she's willing to say, I want what this guy's selling. I want what this guy has to offer. And luckily for all of us, Jesus isn't selling it, he's giving it. You don't need to do anything for it. How wonderful would it be if all of our hearts and all of our minds, when we think about Christ and we think about even people, let's go outside of Christ, let's just think about people we have every right to disdain or every cultural imperative to disdain. Let's say you're a Republican and yet you look to a Democrat talking to you or you're a Democrat and you look to a Republican talking to you, you know. Anything in this life, you're a Broncos fan, you're a Patriots fan, you're a Raiders fan, you're a Lakers fan, you're not, whatever it is, whatever you're going to identify with, I went to CU Boulder, or I went to CSU. There is a massive division here, far greater than anything we can realize between these two culturally. Huge division. And yet Jesus approaches her. And what's even more beautiful, actually, if you, if you go further in the text, you'll find that the very first people group that John records being saved are the Samaritans. It's not Gentiles. It's not Jews. The first people group that has a mass conversion to Christianity, a mass conversion to following Christ in the Gospel of John are the Samaritans, the very people the Jews are supposed to disdain and hate, the very people that are supposed to have nothing to do with the promises, even more than the Gentiles, they are hated and despised, and yet Christ goes to them, and they're saved before the Jews. If that doesn't strike you in your heart, when you think about tensions you have, whether it could be your family, it could be politics, it could be how you feel about different countries, different people, it doesn't matter. If you have that tension in your heart towards anyone, Christ's example is the very people that he says later worship falsely, the very people that broke from the Davidic line, the very people that rejected the Messianic promises and breaking from that Davidic line, the very people who rejected the prophecies of Jesus himself and his coming, he goes to those people and says, I want you for my kingdom. Now, I don't know if... Uh, there are still Samaritans today. Not many, but there's still some. So it's not likely that all of them were actually saved or at least uh, some of them maybe backslid, whatever you want to call it. 
But at least a very huge group corporately in the Samaritan community came to Christ very soon after this conversation. Very soon. Jesus looked to the very people that him as a Jew of the tribe of Judah, of the line of David, should hate. And he said, no, no, no. I don't care what my what culture around here says. I am God. I am king. I am Lord. And I want these people in my kingdom. I want everyone in my kingdom. And so when we interact with people, we have to have the same mindset. We have to have the same desire. The reason why the Samaritan woman is so quick to change her mind on Jesus, whether she gets what he's talking about or, or not, is Jesus is not attacking her. She attacks him, or at least confronts him, right off the bat, and his response is just, look, if you knew what I wanted, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't be doing this. You would ask me for living water. I'm going to tell you that living water will give you eternal life, and it's yours. I want you to have it. Imagine what our conversations would be like with any group of people, whether they're, they're, they're hedonists, living totally against God outwardly and rejecting him, whether they're atheists, whether they're Catholics or, or, or any other group of Christians, whether they're Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, people who claim to be Christian but probably are not Christian, whoever it is, if your response to them is like Christ's and is, let me tell you about eternal life. Let me give you living water. Let me lead you to what will satisfy you more deeply and more greatly than anything you have ever seen, felt, or known. If that was our attitude towards them, and not get away from me, not what the attitude of a normal Pharisee or Jew would have been to the Samaritan woman, if the attitude is, gosh, we, 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 we disagree on so much, and you're living your life in an improper way, but you know what? God loved me when I was in the same boat. Paul talks about this. Does he not? The Apostle Paul, who killed Christians, who at least saw them brought to death, had Christ come to him and visit him, and lead him to an apostolic ministry that was greater than any ministry we could ever begin to fathom or know. That was the guy Jesus used. And these are the people Jesus first saves. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That we were once like the very people that we now think of and disgust. Or we now look at and say, I don't want anything to do with it. That's That's weird. We are in that same boat. We are on the same path, whether or not you did the same things spiritually, you're on the exact same course, the exact same path. And what's going to happen to them, if they keep on their way, is the same exact thing that was going to happen to you if Christ did not come and give you the living water that led to you having eternal life in him. It's the exact same path. You're in the same boat apart from Christ as anyone else you come across. And if your heart is what the heart of Christ is, I am telling you, you're going to see some amazing things in your life. Whether or not people get saved by your words, that's not the point. Christ does the saving. We don't do that. Salvation is between God and the individual and that alone. But God will use you as his instrument and his tool in anyone's life. If you think of your own, if you're a believer here, if you think of your own conversion, you know that there are people that God used as tools in your life to lead you to him. And if you approach anyone, anyone with the mindset that Christ has here, I am telling you, I am telling you, he will use you as an instrument and a tool to see people wander the kingdom in a way that is so beautiful and majestic. You're going to see some people, I mean, I think about my own life and I think about the things I was involved in and I liked and I, and I enjoyed doing. I'm pretty sure a lot of Christians would look at the life I led before Christ came into my heart and, and raptured my soul to him. A lot of Christians would look at the life I led and look at me and say, I want to get away from that guy. I want nothing to do with that guy. And yet you know, God used believers who chose to look past the lifestyle I enjoyed, who chose to look past the, the, the company I like to keep and the things that I said. They chose to look past that and they loved me in a way I had never loved before. The love of the world is love of, if you're like me, I'll love you back. If, if you hang out with me, I'll love you back. 
But the love I experienced from these believers was you can re- say all the awful, hurtful, rejectful things you can say about our God, but we're still going to love you. You're completely different from me. You live a life totally contrary to what I think God wants, and yet I'm going to love you. I think that's how all of us here, if we're honest, are brought to Christ. That's how Christ uses people in our lives, as those who said, I love you even when I should. And that's what Christ is doing here. And the woman, the woman at the well responds so wonderfully to this that it will lead to the conversion of an entire group of people very soon after this conversation. And what's beautiful, too, if you, if you look forward to the text, they say it's not just because of the woman's testimony, but because of the woman's testimony, we went to Jesus. And then we saw Jesus, and when we saw him, we're like, this is the guy. So your testimony and how you treat people aren't going to, lead, aren't going to bring them to salvation, but it will show them who Jesus is, and it will make them look to Christ. And when they do that, Christ will work mightily in their hearts. So the woman at the well's response here, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Our heart and our desire needs to be every conversation we have with somebody. And I don't even think, by the way, I don't think this passage is necessarily a a text about how to evangelize, but I think if you live out what's happening here, it's impossible not to see how to evangelize. If we, if we go into every, every encounter we have with somebody in the hopes to get an answer like this, whether they really understand what we're saying or not, but the response is, I want to learn more about this Jesus guy. I want to know more about him. I want this living water you're talking about. I want this salvation you're talking about. I may not understand it, but I want it. And I want to know more about it. If we approach everyone in a loving, gentle way, maybe they'll reject you, sure. But that's on them. That's not on you. But you should never, ever, ever live a life as a Christian that sees people reject you, not because of Christ, because Christ said, you know, you will be rejected because of me. People will hate you because of Jesus. They will. But that should be what it is. They should hate you because they hate Jesus, not they hate Jesus because they hate you. You can't live that life as a believer. And you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. But if you seek out that living water, as we've been talking about, and look to him solely for your refreshment and your encouragement, you need to get back out there and you need to love people in a way that Christ has loved you and loved all the brothers and sisters we have with us today. I think if we live this out, we will have such a beautiful and wonderful, wonderful journey with Christ for the rest of our lives into eternity. So as we close here, I just want to say to anyone who doesn't know about this living water, to anyone who isn't sure about this eternal life, who doesn't know what it is, or maybe has been approached by it, but turned back, whether it's because of a bad encounter with someone at church, whether it's because of a bad encounter with family members, a pastor, whomever it may be, or maybe it's just yourself. Maybe it's just you trying to cling on to what you think you want and you desire. If you're an unbeliever here today, I'm telling you, I implore you, come talk to somebody. Pull out anyone here who is a believer. There's elders that are going to be up here. I'll be up here um, after we conclude communion today. Please come talk to us. We at least want to have the conversation. We want to show you what love and a Christian fellowship actually looks like. And we really, really, really desire you um, to at least cheer us out. You guys pray with me. Abba Father, we come and we are so amazed by your glory that you go to the very people that would logically be the last you would want to meet and you say, those are the first people I'm going to see saved as a group. Those are the people I want for the kingdom. Those who reject me, those who say no to me outwardly, I want those people that you came not for the healthy, but for the sick. And I thank you that we're all sick in that sense, that we're all sinful, that we all are known by sin apart from you so that you can come into our lives and be our rock and our savior, that it's not about what we do, it's not about who we are, it's about what you love and what you desire and who you are. 
Father, I pray that we live that out. For us believers, I pray we live out who you are and who you are in us. Not what we are in the flesh, but what your, you and your Holy Spirit that comes with the living water will do in us and work in us. And for, us, for those who are unbelievers, I pray that you would implore their hearts to seek out this living water. Thank you for your communion table. Thank you that we get to partake in this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful example of who you are and the work you did on the cross today as well. In the name of that beautiful son, Jesus Christ, amen.